everyone. Right. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm thrilled to see the audience full on a Monday night in the first day of classes, um, filled with your wonderful faces. We have a really special guest this evening. And before I introduce the spectacular Nina Elder, I want to talk a little bit about how this uh, came to be. It's sponsored by the John, John Galmim Lecture Series Endowment, the Endowment. And Nina will be with us for in the School of Architecture and Planning for a week. And so I just want to say a few words about John Galmim. Without, without him, this would not have been possible in his extraordinary legacy. There may not be a single person in the audience who doesn't know who John Gamim is, but I think it's important because of his profound impact on the southwestern landscape and defining an architecture of place and regionalism that we continue to tell his story. He was trained as a civil engineer and was actually born in Brazil and, like so many others of his time, moved here in the 1920s in search of treatment for um, tuberculosis. And he arrived at the Sun Mount Sanatorium in Santa Fe. And during the time that he was convalescing, he became keenly interested in architecture. I mean, I suspect it was always there, but the local tradition of Native American and Spanish, followed through Spanish culture, really propelled his interest in regional local building materials, an incredibly distinct style. So he, um, he gained a lot of his knowledge from the, his volunteering with this Pueblo and Spanish colonial building techniques through his volunteer work with the Committee for the Preservation and Restoration of New Mexico Mission Churches. And while his peers around the globe were really expressing modernism through sort of a machine-like standardization, Meme was expertly developing an architecture born of place and inspired by the rich tradition of Southwest art and culture that were developed by Native Americans and extended by the Spanish. It is important to note that his work was not a historical replication, but a new interpretation of age-old building methods responsive to culture and to climate. Meme was the architect for the Bishop and the Archdiocese of Santa Fe from 1934 to 1944. He designed numerous homes and his firm designed 25 buildings on the UNM campus between 1933 and 1959. Perhaps most well known is Zimmerman Library, a true masterpiece of Southwestern architecture. I actually can't imagine Albuquerque without the presence of his architecture. And apparently, his plans for Zimmerman Library included 41 sections, vertical wall sections, and um, over 21 parapet drawings. So he was meticulous in his detailing and oversaw the work that was done and had them redone uh, if it wasn't correct. His work offers profound lessons about how to build in harmony with the land. His buildings are just as relevant now as they were when they were built perhaps even more so in a time of climate change and dwindling natural resources. His methods and lessons are invaluable and stand the test of time and the change that comes with it. I think here this is a perfect transition to introduce Nina Elder, who, as you will see, concerns herself with questions of time, deep time, materials, artifacts, culture, change. Nina was born in Colorado Springs and received a BFA in painting from UNM and an MFA in painting from San Francisco Art Institute. But I like to think of her as being a true local. She and her equally spectacular sister, Erin Elder, own a home in the South Valley where they live when they are not um, trotting around the globe on various adventures. Nina is an artist, adventurer, writer, researcher, and arts administrator. Her work focuses on the changing culture and ecology of the American West and Alaska. Through extensive travel and research resulting in meticulous drawings and interdisciplinary creative projects, Nina promotes curiosity, exploration, and a collective sense of stewardship. She is the co-founder of the Wheelhouse Institute, a women's climate leadership initiative. 
Nina lectures as a visiting artist scholar at universities across the globe, develops publicly engaged programs, and consults with organizations that seek to grow through interpersonal, interdisciplinary programming. Additionally, she has exhibited her work um, across the globe. It is con collected across the globe as well. She, um, her research has been supported by the Andy Warhol Foundation. Uh, well, actually, the list is really long and extensive. What I would urge you to do is go onto Nina's website and look at her work. Look at the photographs. The opening image is of a hand covered in this yellow pigment with really provocative questions. Who made this hole? What is the actual question? I'll say it later, but it's okay. Like that. <laughs> Currently, um, Nina is a uh, artist in residence for art and ecology, and has is a the first ever creative in residence with the UNM Art Museum. And we nabbed her, the School of Architecture and Planning, for a week to do an all-school design charrette on the notion of deep time. We are thrilled and honored to have her here. So please join me in welcoming Nina Elder. Wow. Um, <laughs> I always get slightly more nervous speaking in front of people that I know, and I know so many of you, so it's just a real honor that you all are here. Um, and I feel like I have to just acknowledge that this auditorium is totally dizzying, so if I like suddenly fall over, just... I'll catch you. Thank you. <laughs> it's so steep. Um, I could make like avalanche jokes or something while we're looking at this snowy and icy scene. Um, so I'm really thankful to the Art and Ecology program. It's, and to Shubankar Banerjee, it's been an incredible experience um, to have time to think deeply and develop um, some major projects here in my home. Um, a huge thank you to the Mellon Foundation for supporting my residency. Um, I have unending gratitude to the UNM Art Museum and to Dr. Tracy Quinn. Um, there's just an incredible amount of trust being put in me and letting my energies just run wild. It's very amazing. Um, Thankful to the School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, as Katya said, I'm working with their entire department around this idea of deep time. We had an incredible session today. I can't believe I still have any vocal cords left, but we're gonna just keep going. Um, and I wanna thank Katya. She's, she's one of the most joy-filled people on the entire planet, and she brings like critical breadth to everything she does, so it just feels really amazing. I invited her to be here with her and the John Gamin Foundation. I just have to say, I grew up going to art school as a little kid in a building that was designed by John Gamin. And it's so cool to like come full circle and to have this support now um, to do this. And I always need to thank the um, Anchorage Museum in Alaska and the Paulette Krasner Foundation. Um, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do without the support they've given me. Let's see if I can. Pardon the technical pause. <laughs> Is it working? Not how it was working. Is it trying to play something? The computer is frozen like a glacier. Like a glacier. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Happening right here. Yes. So I want to begin by acknowledging that 
This is a place that's informed by interruption and by violence. This is a place where one version of time interrupted a much older version of time. I acknowledge the indigenous peoples that have lived on this land. We are on the unceded land of the Pueblo of Sandia. This current state of being is the direct result of the violence and colonialism that changed their way of life. That history foregrounds all action and understanding. I deeply respect this region's first humans and I'm really thankful to be here. I'm also greatly indebted to all the pe diverse people who have shared their stories with me, given me feedback, and helped me understand how to harness my own creativity and curiosity. So I'm gonna talk for about an hour tonight. Um, I'm gonna tell some stories, show some images, talk about art, read an excerpt from my recent book, and show how exploration and curiosity play a part in my practice. So I've spent the last several months creating something called Deep Time Lab that will open soon at the UNM Art Museum. I've always been deeply curious about where we come from and where we are going. And this generous opportunity allows me to investigate this. I have the desire to look back and understand the history of land and people. At this moment though, I feel confronted by and scared by and activated by the future. I feel insecure, but the experience of being an artist in residence has allowed me to bring along some brilliant students and faculty and collaborators to help imagine all of the potential futures. I think we all need to learn from each other. So in the course of this exhibition, we're gonna be asking how we can use this privilege to be amplifiers of that which is under threat. How can we use these connections to hold sacred that which sustains life? And for me, how can I use this privilege to create more opportunities for curiosity, empathy, and vibrant futures? So thank you for joining me tonight, and I hope you'll keep joining with me throughout the next semester. So I'm an artist. I make work about disruptions. I'm obsessed with holes in the ground and piles of rocks. The piles of rocks that are the subject of my drawings are the innards of the earth that after millennia of geologic time have been turned inside out, stripped from their minerals, and then left to geologic time again. They have a slow yet disrupted relationship to natural entropy. The scars in the landscape will surely last longer than these drawings of them. Medicines, machines, money, the materials in our homes and cleaning products and art supplies are all dependent on mineral extraction. We assume our daily needs from the earth. The holes and piles that I look at, these things that we often do not want to look at, these illustrate what we value. My ongoing questions are whether these are disaster sites or are they monuments to human productivity. I question the resiliency of a natural environment <coughs> barraged with industrial veracity. I started going to Alaska to hang out in the Wrangell St. Elias wilderness. Deep within this 13 million acre wilderness, there's a town called McCarthy and a mine named Kennecott. I started going there because this place is overflowing with both piles of mining detritus and glacial moraines, and I find both fascinating. The first time I went, I thought it was just gonna be a once in a lifetime trip. Alaska is now a magnet for me, and I feel incredibly lucky to have continuing relationships to this land and the people who live there. Even today, the town of McCarthy is remote. At the end of a 62 mile long dirt road, the entire town has no running water and no electricity. The 28 people who live there are strong and creative and deeply connected to the land and the seasons that dictate them. And I cannot give an artist talk without showing this image. I saw grizzly bears put traffic cones on their heads and dance with each other in the wild. Unbelievable. So, people always ask me, do you see bears? And I'm like, I see them do crazy stuff. So, I became fascinated with the kind of people and the kind of power that it took to extract metal from these giant mountains. The Kennecott Corporation was backed by the Guggenheims and the Morgan family that eventually became the J.P. Morgan banking family. In the early 1900s, there was electrical shortages. In the early 1900s, they saw there was a potential to build what we now think of as the grid. Electricity and indoor plumbing were possible on a national scale, but they needed copper. 
when in 1904, a surveyor named Tarantula Jack stumbled upon a mountain of almost pure metal. It seemed almost like a joke. How in the world could tons and tons and tons of copper be removed from these towering mountains, moved across huge glaciers, across roaring and unpredictable rivers, to the closest American port, which was more than 2,000 miles away? But greed does amazing things, my friends. Um, in less than five years, the corporation had built a $25 million railroad, which is about 700 or $800 million by today's standards. They created a port city out of scratch, and they started mining. The copper from this mine allowed for electricity, the telephone, and indoor plumbing to happen as, as we know it today. Indeed, up to 7% of copper still in circulation today came out of this mine. When I first started going to McCarthy, I wanted to hate the mine. I'm an environmentalist. But the more I learned, the more I became purely fascinated and attracted to the complexity of the place. <coughs> Kennecott employed mainly immigrants and gave them the best medical care, education, pay, and benefits of anywhere in the world at the time. The level of environmental impact was actually low enough that we still drink water from the creeks and streams today. The scale of human ambition was astounding. The level of innovation is still remarkable. When viewed as a historical site, which is now managed by the US National Parks, Kennecott sparks imagination and a weird reverence. What keeps me coming back to this place is something more complicated. I'm really curious about how we can look at places like this and start to understand how systems are made. I don't just mean patents for leaching copper from ore or the huge advances in railroad technology that emerged from these mountains. What really blows my mind is how one place can show us politics, power, and something about humankind. For example, the consolidated power around this singular mine forced the United States government to create anti-monopoly laws. The amount of wealth it created changed the world. And most importantly, this endeavor made transnational corporations a reality. So since that first trip, I made a series of pretty large scale drawings of the mines that the Kennecott Corporation now owns. Unlike that first mine in Alaska, these mines are renowned for their voracious consumption of space and their unparalleled environmental impact. Through international subsidiary agreements, they now have active operations on six of the seven continents and over a thousand different names under which they do business. This is a drawing of one of their mines in Utah. This is one of their mines in China. It appears so dark and so deep that it makes me think about the Earth spinning on its axis. If humans potentially moving this vast weight of material around the globe might someday disturb the perfect celestial balance. The Kennecott subsidiary corporations have an annual worth of around $147 billion. They're infamous for their human rights violations. They are a huge yet nimble acrobat in the world of finance, law, and international commerce. These drawings took years to complete, but I feel it is my duty to contemplate and, rep <coughs> and represent the greedy perforation of the planet. <coughs> this is one of their mines in Chile, and uh, the mine hole is seven miles across. This is a drawing of their mine, in, their Escondido mine in Peru. It has consumed over 800 square miles of rainforest and indigenous lands. <laughs> Through the months it took me to draw this, I feel deeply contemplative. I feel like I'm memorializing wilderness lost and illuminating the triumph of consumerism. This is one of their mines in Indonesia. It was closed for years, but has recently, be, recently been reopened for rare earth elements to power electronic devices. <clears throat> None of our cell phones or computers would work without this single hole in the ground. We all benefit in myriad ways from this mountainous void on the other side of the planet. In this digital age of connectivity, I want to look beyond my computer screen, beyond my iPhone, and I want to connect with that place. And last I'll show this one, it's a drawing of their mine in Silver City, New Mexico. I just camped here two weeks ago and it's hard to remember there was once a healthy intact mountain where there's now this hole. So because the Kennecott Corporation was pretty darn voracious, 
they joined in a disgusting bidding war for the Anishinaabeg boulder. The solid copper boulder is revered and a sacred object to the Anishinaabeg people. Its spirit has been called upon to improve health and well-being. It was quote unquote discovered by an explorer in 1820, kicking off a contest of greed and extraction. For over 100 years, the boulder was carted around the United States, bought and sold, and treated like a mineralogical freak show. Finally, the US government, with funds from the Kennecott Corporation, moved the boulder to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Because it weighs thousands and thousands of pounds, the only place in the museum that is structurally strong enough to support the, its mass is in the basement next to the service elevator, where no one, including Anishinaabe people, can visit it. In 1991, an assessment was initiated after the Kiwana Bay Indian community requested the return of the Anishinaabe boulder as a sacred object. Repatriation hearings indicate that there is insufficient evidence to establish that the boulder, or any other natural object for that matter, fits the description of a sacred object under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, known as NAGPRA. I contacted folks who work at NAGPRA and cultural leaders from the Kiwana Bay community. We talked about how a museum can hold a sacred stone hostage. How does a community memorialize what is gone? The director of tribal history told me that the scandal is complicated because his people don't believe in ownership of sacred objects. They are to be held in common with all, including his grandkids, scientists, museum curators, and people like me. The boulder is not sovereign as a thing, but sovereign as part of a place. And because that place has been disturbed at the center of this entire story, he identified a void, an echoing space left by dominion, colonialism, and exploitation. When two cultures have such different values, there is dissonance that echoes in that void. And instead of trying to find harmony, the Smithsonian keeps the boulder in the basement. I made this drawing to honor and bring attention to that history. So if we're looking at voids and the colonists who caused them, we encounter this guy, Robert Peary. The same year that copper was found in Alaska, he developed a fever to be the first person to reach the North Pole. This is a before and after image uh, resulting from his northern obsession. Peary spent 19 years bouncing between Greenland and New York, raising money and bolstering confidence that Americans should be the first to reach the greatest mystery of the planet. Meanwhile, Canada and Alaska were thoroughly overrun by the Hudson Bay Trading Company, the de facto governing body for most of the North. At the height of power, the company controlled three million square miles under their trade jurisdiction, which also meant they were building uh, trading posts and military forts. They were waging war as they were spreading disease and religion. They were making the maps and writing the history. With the spoils of their wars, the Hudson Bay Company filled the displays and archives of many American museums. Perry's backers included major American industrialists who were making their millions from mining, logging, whaling, and trapping. They desired new financial frontiers up north and new curiosities to marvel at home, and Peary was their man. <clears throat> Unlike the interior of Canada, Greenland was not a treasure trove of timber and beaver pelts and gold. How could Peary continue to incentivize his funders if all he was encountering was ice and Inuit people? He sought fame, but they sought fortune. What resulted is one of the most unfortunate stories when it still taints how institutions relate to the North. <coughs> Peary lived among the Inuit people of Western Greenland. He depended on them in every way, even though he thought of himself as their savior. His nickname among the Inuit was the Great Tormentor, and his treatment of the locals made his fellow explorers fear retaliation and violence. Peary learned of masses of unidentified metal that were scattered across the region of Greenland, known as Iron Mountain. The Inuit name for these huge rocks have great reverence. They translate to woman and dog and tent. They were held with the same status as the most important elements of survival and culture in the Arctic. The masses were quickly identified as meteorites, each weighing up to 35 tons. Peary took three years to remove them. He built a small railroad and re-engineered the capacity of his boats, 
In 1894, he set sail with, these, with his scientific specimens and six Inuit people. The living specimens included Monique, the kid in this picture, who was age six, his father, and four other people. Upon arrival, all were put on display in the American Museum of Natural History, meteorites and people alike. Guests paid an extra 25 cents to, seeing, to see the living Eskimo exhibit. The museum was unprepared to deal with living humans, and the staff left them to just survive in the basement. It's a long and terrible story, but only Monique survived. The museum defleshed the bones of his friends and family and put the skeletons on display. What absence of ethics allowed this to happen? What absolute dismissal of humanity there were countless opportunities to take steps towards healing, yet they were ignored. Finally, in 1993, the museum began the process of repatriation and the burial of Inuit bones and artifacts. There was no longer a community centered around Iron Mountain. Their relations on trade with the Arctic explorers and the introduction of disease had undermined their land-based existence. The Greenland meteorites are the most studied and the most prominently displayed in the world. Yet their terrestrial story is omitted from history. It was important for me to find this story in people and in place, not just in museums and not just in books. Through Facebook and online research and friends of friends of friends, I met descendants of the Iron Mountain Inuit, all now living in cities. They were referred to the past as something that has holes in it, something that has been partially erased, something incomplete. They are a people squeezed to the margins, where science and mining and oil are central. I made this drawing to honor that loss. Curie's highly engineered removal of the sacred. Um, I, drew, I drew it using charcoal and space material that was provided by NASA. It's on display right now at 516 Arts, so you can go check it out. There are countless other meteorites that have been stolen from other peoples. Nearly all space objects come to Earth are revered by indigenous people, and all are coveted by science. They hold the secrets of the universe, the most rare of minerals. They are the only object that really allows us to touch outer space, the heavens, and deep time. I've explored these cultural conflicts from both sides and have made many drawings. I realize that in these voids, through these erasures, I might be taking the meteorites back. And just so you know, the University of New Mexico has one of the largest meteorite museums in uh, academia, so check it out. <laughs> in trying to understand greed and metals and really big systems, I needed to rewind even farther. I really wanted to understand where it all comes from. So what I learned is that Western science believes that 4.5 billion years ago, the cosmic dance got a little too close, a little too clumsy, and everything got sucked into a black hole. There was a gigantic collision, and things started spinning around each other and spinning out. A galactic wind blew, the lighter stuff got flung away, and left these heavy planetary bodies still swirling around each other. The Earth's hard crust formed around a core of molten space particles. Tectonic plates smash and crash, volcanoes burp, continents form, and bada bing, we have life on planet Earth. <laughs> Fastest history of the universe you've ever heard. Um, because of all this smashing and crashing, the planet that we think of as home is really a mixed up mass of exploded stars, planetary offspring, and things blown here by space wind. Many of the things we value most, gold, titanium, platinum, they were immigrants. They're immigrants from other forms from other planets in the form of meteorites. They were folded into the Earth's core and now are expelled through the grinding, crunching, burping, and erupting forces of geology. It is the meteorites, both on the surface of the Earth and below it, that seem to magnetize human desire. Trying to understand how the universe began, it made me question this void that exists in colonized places, that often exists in memories, and that exists in my art. The universe began as a void, with a wild collision, and the impossible suddenly became possible. Last year, I got to spend some time in the Klondike gold fields. It was a wild experience. Um, this is the place that caused one of the largest waves of human immigration, the Klondike gold rush. 
1896, there were rumors of rivers that flowed with gold, rumors of mountains of solid metal. Before gold was discovered, about 8,000 indigenous people lived on the land. It is just below the Arctic Circle, and human life was close to the cycles of the sun, of snow and ice, of caribou and bison. Later, more than 100,000 new people flooded in with pickaxes and shovels and greed. They hauled themselves across oceans, over mountains, across international borders, bringing far more materials with them than were ever removed from the land. People still toil those soils, seeking their dream, hungry for fallen stars, looking for a bonanza. As I shared me meals and beers and stories with the miners, I realized that we were so very similar. We creative folks and these hardworking miners we all seek the glimmer, an unseen sparkle. We imagine a reality where, through our unique labors, we unearth some great bounty. We are willing to smash ourselves into hard places, work ourselves to exhaustion, follow our vision. If we're lucky, we find that glimmer. Once we have it in hand, that bright thing, we have to convince other people that what we have done is valuable. We ask other people to believe in us, to invest in us, to have faith that we can keep producing the bright, shiny thing. It is beautiful to work with conviction and with dedication. It is a wonderful thing to believe that there's soft sparkle in the hardest and darkest of places. At the same time, I found myself horrified that I was so sympathetic with these miners. Once again, I'm supposed to be an environmentalist. But it became clear to me that without them and their back-breaking work, moments like these, would not be possible. This projector, this screen, the camera that took these photos, the seats you're sitting in, the car that drove you here, a miner pulled every single material of every single one of those things out of the earth. Many years ago, I started making these small drawings of hand-dug mine shot shafts that I found while I was out hiking. They seemed quaint and old, evidence of some far distant ambition. But the more I think about them, these are not voids, but places where, if we look, we can understand our values, our impacts, and what we assume we are leaving behind. But on this hurtling ball of stardust, we don't actually get to leave anything behind. In all of our action, creation, destruction, celebration, and disregard, we are contributing to the future. I think that's why I'm an artist. I can shine a light on these things and ask questions. I can look at a pile of rocks like it's a crystal ball. I can see the future here. Someone once said that I make grotesque places too beautiful in my drawings. But this is what we are working with, and we need to know it. It's our past, present, and future. So I want to mention something that I'm really struggling with. The world is facing unprecedented challenges and so much loss. I think about extinction, biological annihilation, species loss, environmental apocalypse. This is what I read just last week. This is what my headlines look like. Well over the half the world's population of vertebrates, from fish to bird to mammals, have been wiped out in the past four decades. Between 1970 and 2014, there was a 60% decline on average among wildlife populations around the world. Most terrifying to me is the loss of invertebrates, especially the pollinators, those often unthanked creatures who have experienced a 75% plummet in population. I need, to think, I need to thank my friends and family who continue listening to me as I keep talking about this thing, this loss, this new normal. Even as I continue looking into the abyss, I want to retain my wonder and my hope even while I refuse to ignore the facts. I'm really interested in what happens when incremental change starts happening at a palpable and increasingly uncomfortable speeds. I think about how we can continue creating in a time of unprecedented loss. I feel a strange whiplash between the urgency of climate change and my desire to slow down and relish the world that surrounds me. Everything seems like it's speeding up, yet part of me just wants to hug my sister, go for a hike, eat a burrito, read a book, and pet my dogs. 
<clears throat> that sensation is a psychological condition called solastalgia. We all have it. This is a premonition of transition, a sense of loss from an anticipated future. Solastalgia is anxiety about change from a perspective of wholeness. It is the feeling of homesickness before leaving home. It is the idea that we cannot prevent ourselves from moving into the future, yet in the future we might miss this present. I wonder how we can acclimate ourselves to change, to be nimble, to move with intention into the futures. One morning, my mom woke up, and from the sound on her radio alarm clock, she knew that something was absolutely terribly wrong with the world. She turned off her alarm clock and went to the kitchen. She went through her normal routine, make coffee, toast bread, spread it with butter and jam, and sit down at the table to eat. She did one thing differently, though. She did not open the newspaper, but instead ate her toast and just looked out at the backyard. It was September 11th, 2001. I go hiking. If I'm lucky, I collect berries on those hikes. I make small batch jam from those berries. I wonder if time and space is captured in these jars. Can I taste the time and the place where I picked them? What does memory taste like? Can I preserve time? I'm creating a project called the Solastalgic Archive. I am asking people to contribute things to the archive that help us position ourselves within time. What do we do that at once addresses the passing of time, the presence of the past, and the coming of the future? I think we will eat toast and jam in the archive. The greatest teacher that I have when it comes to thinking about change is glaciers. We talk about mountains as the most immovable of entities, yet these glaciers are carving and shaping the landscape around them. They literally gouge and rip and rumble as though they were a bulldozer. Glaciers are at once vulnerable and immensely strong. This is what a receding glacier looks like. It has so much earth in it that it no longer looks like ice, but like an industrial scape. An industrial scrape. It literally is a huge gravel pit. As glaciers retreat, a huge weight is lifted from the earth. The freshly exposed land gains a bit of elevation in a process called isostatic rebound. A huge burden has been removed. The earth breathes in. It expands. It decompresses. The land becomes softer and less dense. Those space particles that were smashed together four billion years ago, they want a bit more space, a little less pressure. The planet seeks equilibrium under our feet. An erratic is a rock that has been transported by a glacier and then expelled once the glacier has melted. An erratic signifies the time and place where the glacier originated, often hundreds of miles and hundreds of years distant. Erratics hold traces of the parent bedrock, the path that the glacier traveled, and the process of deposition. They are time travelers, treasure troves, reliquaries, and rubble. Encountering an erratic is akin to encountering a piece of sculpture. They are often perched in surprising locations and with an unstable or alien appearance. The material presence of an erratic is strange and mismatched to its surroundings. It is often not clear how this solitary rock arrived, alone, an anomaly. Erratics have a newness, a vulnerability, and a childlike awkwardness. They have an aura of meaning and promise and poetry that, for those of us who are not geologists, often remain a mystery. Because I am an artist, I ponder what I am carrying within myself and what evidence my life will leave. What are we creating that will get swept forward, borne along in the destructive path of time, and be deposited in the future? What truths of our now and here will tumble along, resilient and intact, into another here and now? What are the unintentional offspring of our actions? Of course it will be those monsters and mysteries and miracles that will define us. So much more than the smoothly polished contributions that we intend to withstand the test of time. Will the things we make hold the essence Hold our essence as their maker? 
How will our objects and words move into the river of time and maintain their integrity? In some distant time and place, what will they reveal of our time and our intentions? In trying to understand what is in me, what erratic knowledge I carry, I have a practice of making lists. <coughs> Not until very recently did I start taking that seriously. These are absurdly meticulous and large pieces of art where I incise the letters and details, where I incise the letters into the paper and then rub natural pigment into the surface. I then peel each letter and detail out with tweezers. This is an incomplete list of everything that is sensitive, made from volcanic material. The process helps me understand what often feels like random yet important metaphors. It helps me relate to large and complex ideas. These are things that are fleeting. It is made with, with glacial, glacial silt. Sharp pencils, dusk, first kiss, kisses, originality, adrenaline, perspective, shivers, satisfaction, balance, numbness, recognition, the whoosh of a gas stove lighting, Virga, the memory of dreams, tadpoles, horizons, inspiration. This is everything in Alaska. I swept the floor of the Anchorage Museum every night, scraped the mud from my boots after 16 solo hikes, and emptied all of the pencil sharpeners in the Smithsonian Arctic Research Center. All of those weird remnants of Alaska, that is what this is drawing is made out of. It's 10 feet tall. Glaciers help me understand change. Lists and erratics help me understand the results of change. But really, time is the hardest thing for me to imagine. We have such a warped perception of time. For instance, it slows down when we are afraid. It speeds up as we age. It gets twisted when we travel. It dulls when we feel bored. It shines and spins when we fall in love. A few years ago, I went on a jury journey that seemed to both pause time and allow me to see it in a different way. It starts with this funny photo. My dad retired from a long career in government contracts and ended with a final slog in Homeland Security. He was gone quite a bit when I was a kid, working internationally on government contracts and not at liberty to speak of where he had been or why. I remember being in fourth grade, the time this photo was taken, asking him where he had been instead of at my birthday party, and he responded with something in military jargon with lots of acronyms. He often would remind me that he was under a 25-year statute of limitations before he could describe his work. That meant nothing to a nine-year-old. So after I came back from Alaska a couple years ago, my dad was really sick with emphysema, and I went and saw him for the first time in a long time. Because he now knows he will not outlive his 25-year statute of limitations, he finally started telling me a little bit about he, where he was 25 years ago. My talk of northern travels led him to tell me that he had worked extensively in the far north. He was a decommissioning officer on a Cold War era radar system that linked international surveillance equipment to NORAD, the hollowed out mountain in Colorado Springs. These were huge radar systems that flanked Russia and existed in Greenland, England, Finland, Canada, and Alaska. I'm showing historic images of these sites and my drawings of them as well. As a kid, I imagined my dad wearing a suit, getting out of an airplane, walking up to one of these radar dishes on the edge of a flat white ice field and turning a huge switch from on to off. <laughs> I don't think that's how it went. Um, I don't remember him telling us stories ever about the land, the wildlife, the weather, the light, or the native populations that surrounded each of these installations. As I talked to my dad, I realized that his lacking descriptions signified what is symptomatic of a government-approved mentality, one that does not relish stories of place or the sentiments of land. He went to the North with a task at hand, and late Cold War fears and protocol camouflaged everything other than that task. His circumstances shunned curiosity. I decided I had to fill in the rest of this history. I felt compelled to be vulnerable to and curious about the places where the US military had gone, to sense it, to relate to it. I wanted to fill in the map of the Cold War, not just the physical map, but the one of people and time and stories. So within days of seeing my dad, I had decided that I needed to go where so few people go, 
the militarized regions of the Arctic North. I started my trip in Nome, Alaska. There was about 15 hours of travel from Albuquerque. Nome is a strange place to me. It reminded me of parts of the Southwest and that there are several distinct cultures. And to an outsider, it's really unclear how or if they interact. It feels like a true frontier town. It's a gold rush town with a pretty messed up landscape. Over $4 billion worth of gold have been sifted out of their black sand beaches. Native fish camps flourish along the coast, oftentimes between rusting and abandoned mining equipment. The roads in Nome do not connect to anywhere else, so cars arrive by barge. Nome is the farthest flung place in the Western Arctic where the sale of alcohol is legal. Unabashed public drunkenness seemed common, and as in all wild places, churches seem to flourish. I stayed in the home of a Southern Baptist minister who, after his 11 children grew up, turned his gigantic home into a bed and breakfast. He called, he said he felt called to be a light in the darkness for those who have not been exposed to the scripture. He also had hundreds of taxidermied animals that had been shot with the help of local native people. Only a few miles outside of town stood the radars that I had traveled so far to see. Climbing the hill towards those iconic dishes, I passed airplane hangars, a couple more bed and breakfasts, active mines and gravel pits, a fancy medical facility, and a snowmobile and chainsaw repair shop. The area around the dishes feels more like an overgrown city park than a military site. Chain link fences have fallen over and footpaths wind their way through grassy dirt. I was flabbergasted. I had aggrandized this moment in my life where I would stand alone on a mountaintop and taste the Arctic wind and face the expansive tundra and feel all the things that my father had never, that had, he had felt but had never told me about. Instead, the growling of gravel trucks in the nearby gravel pit and the smell of diesel fumes and the leftover trash on the, round, on the ground, it just seemed totally normal to me. So as I walked to and from these dishes during the five days I spent in Nome, something clicked. It is normal. Our lives are totally full of voids, the holes in the ground, the people that supposedly get erased, the rapid extinction. We allow ourselves to not see it. And that is the essence of successful military infrastructure. It becomes invisible. The dishes are part of a much larger network called the Dew Line an acronym for Distant Early Warning Line. It was built to detect incoming Soviet bomber, bombers during the Cold War and provide early warning of any invasion to the network hub in NORAD. It cost over $28 billion to construct. The Dew Line was operational from 1957 until the late 1980s when my dad helped turn it off. Like so many things that I encountered on this trip, I was curious how they had come to exist and how they had functioned. The dishes utilize a technology called tropospheric scatter parallax radar communication. The dishes bounce information off the troposphere, the curved envelope of vapor that forms the interior layer of the Earth's atmosphere. The information is then bounced towards a sympathetic dish angled precisely to receive this information. Even though only one billion billion of messages were ever fully relayed, this was considered effective communication during the Cold War and linked US northern borders with centralized defense units. Those linked dishes create such an interesting illustration of parallax. Parallax is the phenomena that allows multiple views of something to all be true all at the same time. It is the fact that one more than one perspective is needed to create accurate understanding. It is how sailors navigate by the stars and early astronomers and cartographers accurately measure distance. For instance, my hand can block the sun from my own eyes, yet it does nothing to shield anyone else's. A sun visor only blocks the sun for one person because each person is in a distinct spatial relationship to the sun. Parallax, different perspectives merging to create an accurate view of reality. How is it that my father had a relationship to these places without being overwhelmed by the beauty? Or if he was overwhelmed, why didn't he talk about it? How did the military have the audacity to value these sites only based on international proximity? Nome seems to be a sublime place where individual desires flourish in a vastness. 
The miner looks for a flake of gold on a beach. The minister seeks souls to save. A radar is positioned to pick up one billion billionth of a signal coming from space. From Nome, I went to the native village of Wales, Alaska. I learned of Wales because it is 15 miles from Tin City, a fortress-like military and radar installation on the Bering Strait, very close to Siberia. Wales is the farthest western place on the mainland of this continent. It is where the western hemisphere touches the eastern hemisphere. It is on the international date line. It is where the continental divide ends. It has 146 residents. It is 53 miles from Russia across the Bering Strait. And it's really far away from Albuquerque. <laughs> Here is a transcript of my entire planning and orientation to my journey. An email from me to info at nativevillageofwales.com. Hello, I'm an artist, and I would like to visit Wales from July 5th to 10th. Please advise me on how to make this happen. I look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> from info at nativevillageofwales.com to me. I have reserved a room for you in the multi-use building. There will be a kitchen for you to use. Mail your food to the address below at least two weeks before you come up here. Signed, Vanessa. <laughs> from me. Dear Vanessa, this is fabulous. <laughs> Please let me know if there's anything else I need to know. And that was all. I didn't hear anything else. <laughs> so with zero information and an entire continent to traverse, off I went. So when I got there, I uh, landed out about a uh, mile outside of town and walked in and I asked a bunch of kids who were swimming in the Arctic Ocean That's a symptom of climate change that kids are swimming in the Arctic Ocean, I guess um, So a little girl showed me to the multi-use building and showed me which room she thought I would stay in Among a warren of unused office spaces and a big room full of folding chairs My room had a bed a table and a makeshift curtain made of tr black trash bags and tiny pieces of duct tape I was thankful for the curtain because the sun never set while I was in Wales. Even though I mailed my food three weeks in advance, I preceded the arrival of my shipment by one day. So I was thankful that I could buy groceries at what they call the native store. That moment opened me up to the actual reality of living in the Western Arctic. I bought a package, a package of powdered vegetable soup, a can of green beans, and a can of corn. That cost me $21. I was humbled and shocked. In a town that had no visible means of commerce or economic infrastructure, how in the heck could anyone afford to feed themselves? And I quickly realized, no wonder there's so much evidence of hunting and fishing, like severed caribou heads on the beach. I learned the difference between what is referred to as outside food and Eskimo food. It's immense. This is an image of salmon drying on a traditional house. The store was filled with prepackaged food being sold at eight to 10 times the price of what I'm used to paying here in New Mexico. I asked Cynthia, a young woman who runs the store, if she was busy. She told me she works 40 hours a week, often goes hours without seeing a single customer, but they constantly run out of food. The food comes by plane. Every single item is pre-processed and full of chemicals. My preliminary research into the village of Wales revealed two dominant facts. They have the highest rate of suicide, and the highest rate of cancer in the entire United States. So I returned from the store to the multi-use building. There was a youngish guy sitting in one of the interior offices, jamming loudly on an electrical guitar. His name is Dominic. This is his most recent Facebook photo. He did not ask me any questions, but I quickly realized that I needed to ask him some questions. I had no idea where to go to the bathroom. Where should I cook? Could I come and go as I pleased? Did I need keys? So he showed me the bucket that would be my toilet and the 50 gallon trash can full of drinking water that he had hauled from a nearby spring. The building was built with plumbing because it was built by the US government. They neglected to realize that because of permafrost and the lack of any water coming into the town, that indoor plumbing is completely superfluous. So thus the buckets. Dominic works, continues to work the night shift watching the Bering Strait. Around the clock, 
Every day, men work six-hour shifts monitor monitoring the ocean in front of the village to make sure that no commercial fishing vessels or oil tankers are in their traditional fishing areas. If they were to call, the National Guard would come from probably thousands of miles away to remove the trespassing vessel. It's not a very efficient system. Oddly, the office from which they monitor the street has no windows and rarely has any internet. Most of the guys play Tetris on the computer for six hours and then go home. I asked Pete, the guy who works the afternoon shift, about his job. He said he had worked every day for three years and had never made a report. So throughout the day, the village is full of people attempting to work. Vanessa waits for emails like mine to come to the village email address. Pete and Dominic are in the windowless office monitoring the Bering Strait. Cynthia sits in the store waiting for customers. I asked them why they work these jobs that have so little outcome, and a conundrum became clear. To qualify for new government housing and for food assistance, they have to be employed, but having a job takes them away from the traditional activities that sustain the village. The people of Wales lived traditional subsistence lives until very recently. Their existence revolved around the migration of animals, the movement of walrus and seal, the seasons of salmon and bird eggs and caribou. Now they feel forced to work to be able to afford Kool-Aid and white bread and Velveeta. My first day in the village, I walked out to the lagoon that separates the village from the Arctic Ocean. I saw this female caribou laying in the grass and took this photo. I returned and showed it to Sunny, who was working in the office. He said, oh, she's just tired from the heat. He told me that for thousands of years, his people have corralled caribou along the ocean, using these long fences to funnel the herds towards a place where they could be killed. When I went there, the caribou were not following their normal migration patterns at all. They were not coming close to the village of Wales. Sonny told me that year, the caribou harvest was down to one, less than one half of normal. The next day, it seemed like a coincidence, the Navy showed up. They were there to do a pollution evaluation site visit. The entire village of Wales is contaminated from the era of military proliferation and asbestos insulation. It does not take a trained eye to see that there are puddles of oil and heaps of trash and huge pits of toxic waste scattered all over the land. Despite the undeniable proof, the Navy agreed that they might invest in a 10-year assessment period that maybe later would result in a cleanup. They handed out candy to the kids and left. The next day, there was an article in the New York Times that was very optimistic, titled, Alaska Natives Help Study and Clean Up Legacy of Military Pollution. My new acquaintances just left. So finally, I got to go out to Tin City. I borrowed a four-wheeler. Because I did not know how to drive it, Lena, one of the village elders, gave me driving lessons. For two hours, we buzzed around the beaches and the roads. She told me stories above the rattling roar of the engine. She showed me where young people had gone to kill themselves. She showed me where her fishing shack used to be. She told me about how much the land had changed since the military built the road. It bogged up where they picked their greens and unnerved those caribou herds. But now you can get to the far side of the military base where the hunting is pretty good and if you have a four-wheeler, the berry patches go on forever. <coughs> Lena told me that she liked the military. Her uncle and father-in-law had built the scaffolding for the golf ball-shaped radar dish on top of the mountain. She said Wales would not exist if it were not for the economic contributions that the military has brought to the region. At the same time, she refuses to get a pointless job. She lives in a wooden house, and she eats seal and seaweed and salmon. Tin City in Wales occupy a spit of land that is often described as one of the most important cartographic spots on the globe. It is the remains of the Bering Land Bridge. Here, the western and east, eastern hemisphere are only separated by 53 miles. The international dateline swerves around this point of land, so one is always looking at tomorrow. The continental divide crashes into the sea. There are no walls, no fences, no visible boundaries or demarcations. Immense distance and isolation insulates the international boundary more than any wall ever could. The site was originally a tin mine run by non-native miners. 
It was incorporated as a town and had a functioning post office from 1904 to 1907. One can easily see Russia across the Bering Strait from Tin City. People have swam that distance. It is the same distance from Russia to Tin City as it is from San Fe to Albuquerque. It's the only place in Alaska where you can see Russia, and Sarah Palin has never been there. <laughs> <laughs> Tin City is hard to describe. The land feels sacred, magical, intense, yet the structures seem absurdly misplaced and graceless. In a landscape that is expansive and pure feeling, a huge blocky military base surrounded by radar dishes and mountains of industrial waste is bizarre and post-apocalyptic. It is the architecture of false bravado. It is a place that is horrifyingly out of place, stubborn and big and full of pent-up anger. It is easy to see that everything other than its proximity to Russia has been disregarded in Tin City. <coughs> Industrial scale garbage is strewn down the beach. Buildings fall over. It smells of oil and rotten wood. It has been polluted by fear. In many ways, Tin City seems to exist in multiple realities. In one place, it is today and it is tomorrow. In one place, you can feel time immemorial, the time of caribou and seabirds and salmon and the midnight sun. Yet, in that same exact place, it is impossible to ignore the urgency of climate change. And there too, in remnants, is the panic of war, the crisis of fear, and the shuddering, slamming feel of national defensiveness. And there is something older than all of this, like standing on the spine of the earth. I wanted to just be there, on the edge of the world, and just breathe. I grew up in a military town with a fear of nuclear devastation and Russia's ability to obliterate. I stood there in Tin City and tried to muster up that same sense of fear, of the evil other, of the Iron Curtain, of weak boundaries and spies and a threat to our way of being. I could not feel those things. The only things coming over from Russia on that day were clouds. In my personal experience, all threats seem abstract compared with the havoc that climate change is bringing in that part of the world. The United States, under corporate control and as the leader in carbon emissions and rampant consumption of waste, is that threat. The desire to deregulate land and ease extraction, that is the threat. War and arbitrary geopolitical boundaries seem small to me when I take the long view and think about a potentially uninhabitable planet. I've known that our cycles of consumption and waste create poison and that we also ingest that poison. In visiting the Arctic, I realized that most, the most remote citizens of this country feel the most acute symptoms. It is clear to me that the manipulation of the native population through the undermining of their autonomy and devised devastation of their way of life is an attempt to ignore the sickness and deny any need for healing. I thought I was heading to the Arctic to re-script my father's story and to reinterpret a historic militarized landscape. I think I actually went there to understand the myriad stories that create and present the present reality of the Arctic. The multiple simultaneous truths, the parallax that is so often overlooked, and the role of deep curiosity in my own life. As I explored the rubble left over from the half-assed cleanup of Tin City, I thought again about that sensation of soul nostalgia. What can I learn from the past? What exists that will now disappear? What exists now that will disappear? What narratives will get cleaned up and mythologized to become prevailing stories? What monuments are we building? What relics are we tearing down? What is being destroyed that we one day will desperately miss? What is slipping from our consciousness and what helps us camouflage and numb this forgetting? The tundra is surprisingly similar to the desert. You can see forever. The air is dry because of the incessant wind, so distances seem at once foreshortened and immense. The smallest landmark seems monumental in the vast space. Any interruption in that landscape is conspicuous. There's audacity in what is plainly visible, yet it seems to me that few people are really looking. People who are fighting to expand extractive industries in the far north refer to it as a frozen waste, a flat white hell, a void, they position it as so distant that we can't conceive of it, can't care for it, 
can't empathize with it. Spending time in this landscape made me realize that curiosity and empathy are really what is necessary to move with vitality into the future. We have to allow ourselves to fall in love with the details if we're going to comprehend and adapt what will come. I think curiosity will save us. Where my dad's stories were vague, I want to recomplicate this place. Where the government discouraged curiosity, I want to embrace it. Where history has attempted to erase entire peoples and cultures, I want to build relationships and connections. Where science and museums and colonialism have stolen sacred objects, I want to look into that void. Because actually, there's something there. The universe began as a black <coughs> hole. Disruption creates potential. Different futures are being created all the time. It's only a lack of curiosity that makes the future seem so scary. We are the asteroid. I keep thinking about this statement written by the brilliant Timothy Morton and interpreted here by artist Justin Bryce Garglia. It really sparks my imagination. We are the asteroid. I think he wrote it to impart some terrible doom and apocalypse regarding the impact that we humans are having. We are the asteroid. But not all asteroids are a danger to the Earth. They orbit alongside the planetary bodies, remembering that original and peaceful dance. There are millions of them, maybe billions of them, safely and quietly moving with us. Every once in a while, one flashes into our atmosphere, causing a shooting star. So yes, maybe we are the asteroid. Maybe we can choose to silently orbit. Maybe we will destroy the Earth. Maybe we're shooting stars. I want to make something that startles us from this often grim world we live in, cause us to look up, cause us to get curious, cause us to hope. We are brilliant creatures living on a dancing ball of stardust. And to me, that means anything is possible. So I am searching for the glimmer. There are no voids, just great wide open spaces in which the future will happen. Thanks.